Well, tonight we're going to be looking at uh, Psalm 38, and we'll also be partaking of communion later on as well. Psalm 38. What I'm going to do is I'm just I'm going to read through the psalm, and then we're going to go to some other scriptures that give a background to this psalm that David penned. Psalm 38. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in your hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presses me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled and I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before Thee, and my groaning is not hid from Thee. My heart pants, my strength fails me. As for the light of my eyes, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not, and I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus thus I was as a man that hears not, in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope, thou wilt fear, O Lord, my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slips, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity, and I will be sorry for my sin. But my enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are my adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. There's, there's a couple of psalms, this being one of them, that David penned during his time. We felt the, the weight of sin, the heaviness of sin. Now David was a man after God's own heart. A man of great faith. Yet we see here in this psalm, <laughs> sin can be weighty because it separates us. It separates us from God. It separates that, that intimacy with God. We see that it affects Him greatly physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Body, soul, and spirit. No part of David's being is untouched. As he's he's going through the consequences of at the beginning of the psalm, throughout the psalm of unconfessed, unrepentant sin, and sin is weighty. It can have physical consequences, though. Obviously, when we're sick, it doesn't mean we have sin. But actually, what Scott was sharing before we started there, that God does things. You know, to get our attention for our own good. And physical illness for David, the emotional turmoil, being separated from friends, no longer having the light to see, (laughs) no more light of Christ to be able to see clearly when he was refusing at that point to confess his sin. 
But even in that place that David was, because who David was, he starts out that psalm with, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in your hot displeasure. He knows God's character. So even in this place where David's at, he knows how merciful the Lord is. Let's go read the back, background for this psalm. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now this, this is when David decides to be disobedient. It started out with disobedience. And like an avalanche that just kept coming. The consequences and the realities and the power of sin kept taking place. 2 Samuel 11. It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. And when I've, I read this, and I read this story, and I was praying about this, and I thought, you know, this, this Word of God that we hold in our hands, you know, it's God breathed. It's penned by the, through men, but by the Holy Spirit. In every word and everything in it, God's trying to communicate something to us. He could have left certain things out about this whole story. But it all starts off with that first thing. When kings go forth to battle. You know, and there's times, because we are in a spiritual battle, and there's times where we're called to, to rest physically, but we have to understand that spiritual battle is always raging. There is no rest, if you will, from that. No vacation, if you will, from that. Because the devil doesn't take a vacation. Our flesh doesn't take a vacation. It's always there. And it's powerful. And its influence is powerful. So this whole thing starts out with David really being idle. And we think about Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah and obviously the, the homosexuality and the things that were going on there. But if you look in Ezekiel, it lists the sins of Sodom. And one of the first things it says, it, they ate the bread of idleness. They ate the bread of idleness. And idleness is always going to result... <laughs> in things that aren't good. If we're not busy about the Lord's business, guess what? We're going to be busy about our own business. And if we're busy about our own business, then we could be so easily deceived, so easily taken from this place here to way over here. And as we read this story, it starts out, King David, a mighty man of God, he's over here. But we'll see, over a short period of time, you wouldn't even recognize him. You wouldn't recognize his character, character or recognize anything about him. And if it can happen to King David, who are we? It can happen to any one of us. And it speaks to <laughs> not letting our guard down. You know, in Ephesians 6, it tells us, you know, in spiritual warfare, to put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, sword of the Spirit. It'd be like going out to battle, and you're just chucking your sword to the side, the Word, not reading it. Got the shield of faith, 
throw that thing down. Helmet, well, we'll take that off too. Well, I mean, we're saved, but you, you know, you're not really walking in that. You're not really thinking about that. You're not having God as your focus, and you're just going out to battle. No shield, no sword, no nothing. And you're going against somebody armed with the shield, armed with the sword, and going to come chop you down. Got to have your guard up. David sent to Joab, continuing in verse 1, and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Idleness. Just hanging out. He's the king. He's won all these great battles. Surely, I'm David, surely I've won all these great battles. Surely I can take a break and just hang out. You know, while everybody else does, does the work. And we'll see later how that changes his character. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Uh, he's in trouble. He's in big trouble. He's remained idle. He's just hanging out. And you know, those are the times where the enemy's just waiting for. Just waiting for us to just kind of be spiritually lazy. Kind of just hang out. And then before we know it, we're smack dab in front of something that without Christ is overwhelming to us. And that's what it is here. David would have to be, David would have to be on guard because, you know... We're not created to be able to look upon things like that and not fall, plain and simple, you know. And the scripture for sexual immorality, the only answer to it is one thing, to flee. That's it, flee. That's the only answer you're going to find in the Word of God for sexual immorality. You can't sit there and stare at it, hang out with it, linger on it a little bit, think upon it a little bit. Uh Uh-uh, you're going down. David sent and inquired after the woman. Man, that didn't take long, did it? Man of God, sitting there, and he already is. What is he doing? Inquiring after the woman. Get this though, how merciful God is. God trying to get his attention beforehand. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Like, wake up, David. That's one of your mighty men warrior's wife. He's out to battle right now. You're sitting here on on the rooftop, hanging out in idleness. You have a mighty warrior fighting for you. That's his wife. You aren't to touch her. Warning. You don't have to go there. God's being merciful. Sin can be powerful. Sin can be powerful. It can dull the senses so quickly to the point where, at this point, David's already at the point where he has to have it. Warning, everything else like that, you're learning like, what the heck is going on here? David, that's one of your mighty warrior's wife. You better stop now. Nope. Verse 4. David sent messengers and took her. He's the king. I, I, I want that. Uh, no, I, I know it's, it doesn't matter. I want that. I want that. And isn't that the way the sin, sin gets all of us like that? Where we're willing to just do anything for it? Where we get to the point where, no, I, man, I, I just want that. I just want that. It could be... In this case, a female, it can be a male, it could be money, it could be houses, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, anything. Sin just changes us, man. Changes us so quickly where we're chained. And you've got to understand the backdrop of this story. That's why it's so applicable to us because this is talking about a man of God. So this is speaking to people who truly Truly know Jesus Christ. Truly are born again. It's 
a man of great faith. David sent messengers, took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house. So at this point, David got what he wanted. Huh. Uh, sin never ends there, though. It's, it never ends. I thought about it like an, it, it multiplies exponentially. It's not 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. It's more like 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. So you got like a 4 that is 7th power, which is like 16,384. And you know how quick you can go from 1 to 16,384? Quickly. 4 to the 7th power. Just a little number 4, little number 7 up there. But it ends up with a big number. And that's what sin does. David thinks he's done with it. Done. No, no, no consequence. It's hidden. It's all good. Wrong answer. The woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. You know, in a lot of, you know, in this country here, we, we have it, abortion. And I thought, you know, many times that people want to get out of the consequence of their sexual immorality, and that's why they have an abortion. But that isn't going to happen here. David's not going from that route. He's got to come up with another plan. He's not thinking like that. So David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. It's his mighty war, one of his mighty warriors. And that's what sin will do. So you go from the lust, you know, you go from the pride, the idleness, the disobedience, you're ignoring war warnings, your heart's set on sin, you're engaging in the sin, you're getting consequences of the sin, but now you're going to try to get out of it. You, you're going to lie, you're going to deceive, you're going to scheme. And, and, come, who hasn't been there? Who hasn't, you know, we got this sin and then that sin and we're trying... We've got to somehow stem the tide. And so to stem the tide, you've got you to come up with another plan. You've got to come up with another scheme, another way to cover it up. We've, we've all done it, so we can all relate to it in a certain extent. We don't have to commit adultery like David here did in this, this instance to be able to relate to that. So verse 7, And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war, was, war prospered. So your eyes got to be thinking, what's the... David's like, hey, how's the war going? How's Joab doing? How you doing? <laughs> so David said to Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house. And there followed him, says a, a lot of food, a gift of food, a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord. And went not down to his house. What an honorable man Uriah is here. You don't want to overlook that in this whole story here. What an honorable man Uriah is. He's called off the battlefield. He's got an opportunity to rest. And he actually has deserved it because he's been out there fighting. He, he don't want the food. He don't want, he, he, he don't want that. He has an opportunity to go home to his house to sleep with his wife because that's what David wants here. Try to cover up his sin. That's the plan he's hatched. He won't do that. Not only won't he do that, he sleeps with the servants on the steps. When they told David, saying, verse 10, Uriah went not down to his house, David said to Uriah, Came thou not from thy journey? Why then didn't you go down into your house? And here's the difference at this point between Uriah and David. Because this is just out of the... David ain't even thinking like a righteous dude. He's thinking like he was thinking right now. I'd be going home. I'd be going, you know, Bathsheba's there. I got this food. I'm going to live it up. Food, drink, sex, all of it. That's where David's heart's at. But verse 11, Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel... Man, he's thinking about God. <laughs> he's thinking about God and God's presence. <laughs> he can't possibly do it. 
The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go down to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul lives, I will not do this thing. This man is just determined. I mean, he's saying that this ain't happening. And he lays out the reasons why. And it started with the first thing he mentioned, the ark. He's not going to dishonor God. And because of that, he loves God and he loves his fellow man. His neighbor as himself. He wouldn't want one of his buddies that were out on the field to come back and do that. He's not going to do that to him. And when you're focused on God, you'll have the right perspective and you'll consider others better than yourself just like Uriah is here. Is David going to stop there? No. He's desperate. He's desperate at this point. He's desperate. He had to hear that. And yet, you think hearing that might pierce his heart because he's talking about the ark. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about his men. You would think that would, that would impact David's heart. But at this time, like a wall. And that's why it says in Hebrews, for all of us, it says to encourage one another daily. Why? Because of the deceitfulness of sin and the hardness of our hearts. David said to Uriah, verse 12, Terry here today. Hang out with me. Hang out. We're just going to hang out. And what are we going to do? We'll see. And tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. So that's what they're going to do when they're hanging out. Eat food and get drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. Did the exact So this guy, Uriah, was so focused in that statement that he could, and you have to be that focused. You have to have that mentality that no matter what, he goes, as my soul lives and as your soul lives, I'm not going to do this thing. And you have to have that type of determination to fight against sin. Not that we can fight our own power, but through faith in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, know that I'm not going down that road. I'm not going to do it. Because if he didn't have that, man, when you get drunk, what, and those, those barriers go down, go down, and then you're drunk and you're thinking, the wife's over there. You already had to eat the food, you already had to drink, the wife's at home. Nope. And that's what David was banking on. He was banking on lowering the defenses of Uriah because he showed so strong a defense. He goes, surely, this is, I got the answer for this. I got the answer for this. I'm going to get him drunk and he's going to go down there and he's going to sleep with his wife and I'm, I'm out of my sin. <sighs> wrong answer again. And God's, God loves David enough. He's not going to let him go out You get away with that. And it came to pass in the morning. And you see how quickly this goes on now? This is a quick thing. It came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Man, he sends, this man's carrying his own death, death sentence. His own death sentence in his own hand. From the king. David, who he respects mightily. This is mighty King David and the men loved him because he went out to battle with them. He went out to war with them. He was in the trenches with them. But man, how his character changes here when he's not in the battle and he's not in the trenches. He's not doing that. He is now placing in one of his mighty men's hands a letter. It's his execution letter. And he's carrying his own execution letter. He's carrying the instructions. Here you go. Uh, this is how you're going to kill me. Man. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set you set you Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire you from him that you may be smitten and die. Man. David has been on the battlefield so many times. 
so brave. This man stood up against Goliath when no one else would. And now he's at the point where he's giving a death sentence to this honorable man, telling the, the men to pull back. Leave him by himself. And amazingly cowardly. He's asking his army to do an amazingly cowardly thing. So he's not, and he's not even willing to do it with his own hand. He's bringing so many people into this wickedness. He's asking his army, who's he, he's over, to do it for him. It really speaks to you, you got to be real careful with authority and the power that it has and your power to impact people for good or for evil. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city and he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people and of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. So other people went down with this plan too. <laughs> you know, I hadn't really even considered that. I just, as I'm reading it, I just considered that. All these times I read this story that he was responsible for Uriah the Hittite's death, but what about these other guys? Would they have been there and died? if not for this scheme and plan that David hatched? It speaks again to that authority. Got to be careful with that. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying, Thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king. And if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh to the city when you did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? So in other words here, in order to accomplish this plan, they have to, Joab has to do something that he knows is not proper warfare. And he knows it's going to result in people dying. Because that's what he was instructed to do. And in order to get the one to die, there's got to be a few other casualties with it. And in fact, he's got to send this to the messenger because David will actually get upset about this. Thinking, you guys aren't doing this right. Well, you just commanded that thing, man. That's crazy, isn't it? That's what sin will do. That'll, that's what sin will do. It'll make you like a little fly. You're that fly, and you just flew into that spider web. He flew into that spider web when he stayed behind. And then guess what? That web started to wrap around him underneath the legs, over here, around the waist, until you're, you're done. You're done. Verse 21. Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jeribasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died? So he's even given the reason why, look, this is what happens when you come too close to the wall. Hey, the women there can start throwing down rocks and killing dudes. It happened. Got some history there. But he's doing this as a defense to David because he knows what David's going to say. It says, Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Well, then if that's the case, well, doesn't, everything's good. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even to the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, uh, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. For the sword devours one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. So up to this point, even after all this time, here it is, David gets what he wants. 
There he is. Got Bathsheba. That's it. All this that you've gone through, you did. Murder. Doctor. You, you got the prize. You got it. End of verse 27. We don't want to be in this spot. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Never think because that there's not consequences that have come down the pipeline yet that they're not coming down. Never think that God hasn't seen it. He has. I'm going to go on to chapter 12 here. Because it says in Numbers, be sure your sin will find you out. That thing will hunt you down. Haven't you had your sin hunt you down as a Christian? As a believer? It just, until you get that thing right with God and confess it, that thing will hunt you down. Chapter 12, And the Lord sent Nathan, Nathan unto David. And he came to him and said to him, There are two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his, his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. There came a traveler unto the rich man. He spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wafering man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, he said to Nathan. As the Lord lives, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. What did it say in that psalm about the light? The light. The light's gone off, man. The light is off. He, he is blind. He can see somebody else's sin. He is absolutely blind. Nathan said to David, you are, you are the man. You don't want to be the man in this case. You're the man, Nathan says. The prophet points the finger at where it needs to be pointed. And now, now through God's mercy, He's going to speak to him. He's going to speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. God's reminding him how good he is and has been to David, how faithful he's been, how merciful he's been. And I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I moreover have given unto thee such and such things, even more. If that wasn't enough, David, I'm good, I'm God. I love you, I'm merciful. You don't have to go over here and search for things outside of my will. I'm good, you know me. My heart is for you, I love you. You don't have to go off the narrow path. Make your path straight, David. You don't have to go to the right or to the left. Verse 9, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be your wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. So, God notices even the fact that he did it, and he did it, allowed his enemies to kill him. To kill Uriah. His enemies, the Ammonites. He's like, not only did you do this, but then you did it by the sword of Ammon. And there's consequences for the rest of David's time on earth because of that. And that's something to take a look at. Is that God, and we're going to look at the other part of this, God grants that repentance and his mercy and his love and that fellowship's restored. But sometimes there are consequences of sin that we have to live with on this earth. But it's God-ordained consequences. But we won't have the eternal consequences. 
It's better to have the earthly consequences, which are but for a moment, the scripture says. That life is, life is as a vapor, than to have the eternal consequences. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from my, thy house, because you have despised me, and has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thy own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, so at this point, God lists out the consequences that he's going to get. His family members, his, his children, daughters and sons, there's going to be incest, there's going to be murder. Horrific things, man. Horrific things. This is King David. But here we go. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's true repentance. David sinned against all kinds of people here. So many people. But he realized he sinned against the Lord. He sinned against the Lord. And that's what godly sorrow is. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. But worldly sorrow leads to death. David realized he sinned against the Lord. He's done this wickedness against the Lord. Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away thy sin. You shall not die. Howbeit, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. We're ambassadors of Christ. We don't want to give the enemy occasion to blaspheme the name of the Lord. God takes that very seriously. He takes it very seriously. We don't want to be like a... When the righteous fall down before the wicked, the proverb says, it's like a troubled fountain. It's like a fountain with just nasty stuff coming out of it. Because this fountain's supposed to be beautiful water coming out of it. Like the Holy Spirit, fountains of living water. And instead, there's just this nasty stuff coming out. We don't want the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Continuing in verse 14, The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. It's a hard consequence. Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare to David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Until David's repentant, because he knows God's character. He knows how loving and merciful God is. So he knows how loving and merciful God is. Perhaps God might, might show mercy in this case. He's going to seek the Lord with all of his heart. His heart's changed at this point. It's completely changed. His sin's been exposed, but he's embraced that being exposed. You don't hear David say anything about those consequences. You don't hear him complaining about anything. He fasts and gets on his face for seven days. Didn't eat bread. Didn't get up off the earth. It says it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? And they thinking, man, he's going he's gonna to do some damage to himself once he finds this out. But David saw his servants whispering. He perceived that the child was dead. David asked them, and they said he is dead. David arose from the earth, got up, washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, and came to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Came to the house of the Lord and worshipped. His heart had been changed back to, this is David. This is the David we know. They set bread before him and he did eat. And his servant said to him, What thing is this you have done? You did fast and weep for the child while I was alive, but when the child is dead, you, you rise up and eat bread. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? And now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. He 
man, this... It's such a blessing to have the Word of God, to be able to see, and God does it with many great people of faith, man, throughout the Scripture that He speaks so highly of. He, he exposes, through the Word of God, God exposes their sin. And we definitely, all of us, we're, we're no better. That's the thing about the Gospel it's, it's an even playing field for all of sin and false short of the glory of God. But the gospel is for everyone. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as, as believers, it says, you confess this is sin or her sin and forsakes it shall have mercy. So, God is so merciful. And one of the most merciful things God can do to us, for us, is uh, expose our sin. If we're willing to embrace that. If we're willing to embrace that. Worship team, would you mind coming up? I'm going to read uh, First John chapter one. First John chapter one, starting in verse five. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have no not sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But verse 9, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And before we partake of communion here, in reading the passage out of Corinthians 11 there, it speaks about judgment. If we had judged ourselves, we would not be judged of the Lord. In other words, if you if you're willing to heed what the Lord is saying, willing to allow the sin in our lives and our hearts to be exposed, to confess it and forsake it, you won't have that fellowship impacted. You won't have that intimacy with God impacted. Because it says at the communion table, many were sick, many were weak, some of them died because of sin. unrepentant sin and the reality is you might be sitting here tonight and you don't have some major thing going on like David where you've gone from here and you're way to heck over here where you can't see nothing and you're willing to do anything for that sin but you might be you might be in that place where you're a little bit idle where so to speak you're kind of just Standing on that rooftop, sitting back. Or you might be at that place a little further along the road where you're kind of playing with fire a little bit with that sin. Thinking maybe just a little bit of it. I can handle just a little bit of that. Or you might even be a little further. And now you're inquiring of that thing, like David did. You're, you're seeking it. You're seeking it strongly. And the Word of God, that, that was like a warning, you know, that just jumped out at me that God was so merciful. He tried to warn David before he took it any further. 
God is so merciful. And you see, when David's perspective was right again and he repented and got right, it was godly sorrow over his sin. He sinned against the Lord. He was able to see clearly how much God loved him and how gracious he was that he was willing to fast and pray for seven days that perhaps God might be gracious enough to do that because he knows God's heart. He is a man after God's own heart. And the communion table speaks to intimacy. It speaks to intimacy. And the only answer for sin? What's the answer to sin? It's the blood of Jesus. It's forgiveness found at the cross. His arms are wide open for us. He, he doesn't want us to stay in that. In John 3, it talks about men who loved their deeds and they wanted to remain in the darkness because their e deeds were evil that they not be exposed. We as believers, <laughs> it should be opposite. We should love the light because then our deeds are exposed. And we don't have to keep going down further roads. We don't have to get bound up like that spider web. Don't have to do it. So before we partake of this communion table tonight, and we're going to sing a song. This altar is open. And after the first song, we can come on up and grab the cup, grab the bread. Man, but take this opportunity. Take this opportunity. And we want to stay close to the Lord. In that psalm, man, David was so affected by it. His heart was ripped up physically. He was afflicted by the Lord because the Lord was trying to use that to get his attention. And he had no more light to see. We want to be able to see. We want to honor the Lord. We don't want delayed obedience. <laughs> we want to see God do mighty things in our presence. Don't we? Amen? We want to see Him work. We can't, we can't change our hearts. We can't do that. We'll get tangled up in sin so easy it's not even funny, man. So quickly. This flesh is powerful. The devil's powerful. But the scripture says, He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. That's speaking of the Spirit of God. It's Jesus Christ. We serve a living Savior. He is alive. And He'll take you where you're at and lift you up out of that place. Yeah. He'll bring you into the light. And that glorious light of the gospel and that intimacy with Christ and love and peace and gentleness and joy can be yours again, mine again. He is so merciful. He still used David mightily after that. He used him mightily for his kingdom after that. And we all can speak to not only how God has used us, maybe not as mightily as David, but we desire to see that, but used, used us in spite of our past sin, forget before we were saved, but even since we've come to know Christ. And we've allowed these things to enter in. But we, what we don't want to do, what we don't want to do is harden our hearts against the voice of that Holy Spirit speaking. We don't want to harden our hearts against that. We want to lay down and let that light expose whatever's there and surrender it to the Lord. That's where joy is found, man. It is. That's where the greatest joy is found. Just being in His presence. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not way over here. You're not over there. You're, man, your, your heart's set, set on the Lord just like David was before that. Your heart's set on God. Well, then pray that God would give you the grace to continue in that. Pray that God would not allow 
pride or arrogance, which could be just as bad as those other things that enter into your heart. Pray that not be the case. Pray for somebody that you know that's entangled in sin like a spider web, a brother or sister that God's putting on your heart right now, that God would bring great conviction and set them free. And it might take physical pain. And it might take emotional pain. And it might take their eyes being darkened for God to finally do something to get their attention. Pray for them. We're brothers and sisters, man. We need one another desperately. communion cup and the bread the cracker
And I want to say is before we take this that in preparing for this, you know, <laughs> the Lord had to, man, challenging to show me maybe I'm maybe I'm that guy's already just still maybe hanging out a little bit. Maybe just playing around with stuff with sin a little bit too much. You know, so when I share these things, I, man, really had to had to examine myself and I also had to think back to some of the sweetest times I've had with the Lord is when the Lord granted me true repentance and exposed exposed my sin. Because I prayed, Lord, see if there be, like David did pray in another psalm, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And when you pray that prayer, and God will answer that, man. And when He does show you just how sinful you are, man, it's an amazingly long list. And one time in particular when I did that in my life and God just exposed it all. The pride, the arrogance, selfishness. One of the biggest ones. Selfishness, lust, greed. But man, without Christ we have no, but with Christ, with the blood of Christ, the, the body, that he, that's, that's life. He came to give us life and life abundantly. In that same verse in John 10.10, it says, The thief has come, the devil, to steal, kill, and destroy. And you see, what took place in this story with David, he ain't going to just stop here. That thing will be like that exponential multiplication thing. Four to the seventh power. It won't just affect you. It can affect your spouse. It can affect your family, your children, your neighbors, your friends. Your health, everything. The devil wouldn't be satisfied until you're snuffed out, man. Until you're snuffed out. And then that, that wouldn't even make him satisfied. He'll try to affect the next generation with that. And maybe another generation with that. If he can use that. But man. <laughs> we can go to Jesus and let his... Let His blood cleanse us from our sin, man. So to me, this is... There's warning in here, but man, there's really joy in there. There's joy. Because we just want... We just want Jesus. We want more of Jesus to shine through in our lives and our hearts. We already know what we have. Others already know what we have. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Take of the bread. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. Father, Lord, we just thank You so much for loving us the way You do. Father, we just thank You for the cross. We thank You for Jesus. We thank You. Just like that Scripture said, it was 